You're on. All right. So, hi everyone. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank Digital Futures for this opportunity to for us to share our work and teach uh, how you could use creative AI for design explorations. Uh, in this workshop, we'll give you an overview about how uh, using clip and other generative models, you could uh, create design artwork. So first uh, half will be theory, second half will be doing hands-on implementation in Colab. So first of all, uh, I would like to thank Daniel Russell for his time to give this presentation. Daniel is a pioneer in doing cutting edge creative AI work. He has published uh, a lot of uh, his uh, scripts and open sourced uh, his scripts. So people like us can develop uh, artwork on top of it and do modifications for our own domain uh, use case. So I would love, like to invite Daniel uh, to give a presentation on his explorations and thoughts. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, uh, I know that this is a Click and BQGAN presentation, but I figured um, I should sort of give you an idea of everything Click is capable of. Um, so you know that there's, there's more out there that's possible. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, so I'm gonna skip the sort of explanation of what exactly Clip is. Um, it might be covered later. Uh, and I just have a few minutes, but um, in January, OpenAI's Open Clip had released um, this year. And within, it, it was only meant to classify images. It was never meant to create images. Um, and within only a week of its release, somebody by the name of Ryan Murdoch um, had figured out how to um, generate images with it. And this was with, this here was called Deep Days, this first, me first method. Um, it was pretty simple. Uh, kind of smooth, interesting looking, um, but a bit, I would say, uh, what's the word? Not natural looking maybe. Um, and along came VQGAN a few months later. Um, VQGAN was great at representing uh, deep textures and understanding the, conte the contextual or uh, positional um, metadata about the information. Uh, so it was able to generate higher resolution uh, images. And not only can you use it to generate images, uh, like you can see here, uh, this is a portal into another realm. Um, this is actually a screenshot from a video I'd made um, right here, in which uh, today you're probably going to be learning about well, actually, I'm not completely sure, but you may be learning about how to uh, uh, go through the process of creating an image through VQGAN. And um, the usual process is Clip is looking at sort of the same stable image that's being um, pushed around over time by the optimizer. Um, what I did here is in the step in between, I move the image a little bit. Um, I give it a little bit of a swirl uh, and I stick it back into VQGAN. And I'll try to play this here. You can see I'm sort of shifting the image a bit, zooming and swirling all at the same time to create this portal effect. And then you come out on the other side. Um, this uh, was one of my first um, attempts at that. And you can see something else uh, here, which is just a sort of random uh, example of the different sort of effects um, you can get with this technique. Um, on top of um, VQGAN though, there are a ton of different methods that you can use CLIP for. Um, this is CLIP combined with a simple convolutional network. Um, you can see here the sort of way different effects, uh, a completely different visual or artistic style. Um, and here's another result from the same network here um, of a huge oil painting of a Baroque sort of a bouquet. Um, but th yeah, there's a ton of different <laughs> uh, ways to approach using clip. Um, this is controlling um, SVG 
or vector graphics. Um, it's gonna be a little bit hard to see on the right side because of the rainbow noise background, but over time, there are tiny little um, curves and lines being added to the vector graphics, moving around, jiggling a bit until they're just in the right spot that Clip thinks it represents the prompt that you're going for. Um, you can see another <laughs> result. I ran overnight and didn't expect to wake up to such a mess, um, but <laughs> it's something, it's art. Um, then, uh, I had tackled um, trying to control a 3D mesh with Clip. And this was one of my first results, Obama sandwich. Um, so I was showing Clip one view of this mesh, um, letting it move around the vertices in the same way that it would move around the pixels on a 2D image, um, according to what Clip saw. Um, and it, it's both optimizing the texture and the shape of the mesh. And while it might look interesting from this angle, um, it turned out since I was only using one camera, uh, the mesh wasn't really a good mesh. And you can kind of see that from here that it's a bit pointy and pokey, but once you turn it sideways, you realize it, it's a terrible mesh basically. Um, so the next step was adding more cameras. Um, Clip needs to judge this model from every angle since it was only ever made for 2D. Um, it's kind of like you picking up an object and turning it around, looking at it. Um, so this was a skull in the style of Dali. You could see it was sort of a skull and a bit of the um, surreal nature of Dali's artwork. And over here is an octopus. Um, and I had it up here. This is a recent um, uh, generation of mine towards a, I believe it was a 3D mesh of a volcano on a white background. <laughs> Using the on a white background part in the prompt makes it easier for Clip to understand it doesn't need to deal with the background that it should be an object in the middle of a white space. Um, and so I'm still working on that. Uh, I, Think there's a lot of more progress to make. Um, I had next gone on to point clouds. Um, you can see here the cyberpunk earth. Um, this one was very similar in tactics to the 3D mesh generation, um, which I didn't completely explain, explain, but it's more than just multiple cameras. It's putting cameras in random spots. Um, and this right here was a bit easy, I guess, um, because it was a sphere. Uh, it started as a sphere. It was easy to make it look like an earth. Um, I tried some more complicated things. Here was a Samoyed dog, those uh, sort of fluffy white dogs. When I came to check on the generation, I noticed that it looked the same from every angle, as you can see here. I was worried that my cameras weren't randomly moving. This is the sort of opposite problem of the mesh, of the Obama sandwich mesh. Looking at it from every angle, for hours, or I'm not sure that generated for hours, but for quite a while, <laughs> caused Clip to optimize the, the point cloud to look the same from every single angle. It's sort of a weird optical illusion. Um, there's also been some sort of combat, uh, what do you call it, co-training maybe, of Clip with other networks, a sort of combination of these networks. This network, ES uh, Res Next, um, was created for sort of like audio spectral purposes, not completely clear, um, but somebody had trained uh, it to sort of sit alongside clip and add one more dimension of uh, multi-modality, um, which is audio on top of the clip and text, and on top of the image and text. Um, here was one example, and please let me know if the audio doesn't- I shouldn't do it. Oh, kind of loud, kind of really loud, okay. <laughs> So this image here was actually generated um, by the audio instead of a text prompt. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty cool, I think. Um, it sort of, it will try to match what was found in the original data set of, um, of uh, basically audio from YouTube videos and they have the images alongside the audio to to train on. Um, more recently, 
um, there's been some sort of more development on how can we push CLIP to, um, to sort of guide a more basic um, form of generation. In this case, instead of any GAN or general, uh, generative model, this is just CLIP and the pixels. Um, CLIP and RGB pixels, basically. Um, there's a ton of knowledge inside CLIP. It's only 350 megabytes, the actual CLIP model itself, and yet it can really un uh, like unleash its um, knowledge on the canvas. Um, this is some more recent work on um, how far can we push that idea, um, limiting CLIP to deal with a tiny amount of pixels and um, sort of, there's a lot of little nuance and techniques to make this sort of thing work instead of just creating a uh, colorless blob sort of thing. Um, and there's actually a lot more to explore, but that's that's sort of the sh all to show that clip is really a hammer for any nail. Um, and there's still a lot more to explore. And I hope you uh, enjoy learning to explore clip with Geek again today. That's a incredible presentation. Like, I, I'm I'm blown away with like the work you did. Like, I always like uh, follow your Twitter and work on Discord, and it's so inspiring. So, thanks a lot for sharing the whole process and your recent work with us. Sure, thank you. Um, I need to drop out for another event that I accidentally scheduled at the same time. So, thank you, everybody. Uh, hope you have a good time. Thanks, thanks Daniel. Thank you. All right, so uh, next uh, we have Daniel Escobar, um, who will be giving us a presentation about uh, what are the different ways a, a clip can be explored and high level overview about AI and different multimodal models. So Daniel, your, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Share my screen. Okay, so um, a title for this was Semantic Generation, and the idea behind it is that, uh, like uh, Daniel Ross was explaining, is that when you combine uh, text and image uh, with Clip, um, what Clip is really doing is trying to build like this mental map in a way of all the things that it has seen, and it provides access to some uh, semantic or meaning of what it can generate based on text. Um, so what is intelligence? Uh, it's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills uh, to make decisions. And if you think about like artificial intelligence and, and what like we want AI to do, let's say we get to the point of uh, general art artificial intelligence, uh, we want like a machine that can observe the environment, uh, learn from the environment by processing observations, and then be able to make decisions on, on that knowledge that it gains. And the most important part about uh, machine learning, deep learning and artificial intelligence is that it's able to like uh, pretty much do pattern recognition on a variety of uh, data sets. Um, so that's the idea behind how it can process um, the information, right? To be able to take either uh, through unsupervised methods or self-supervised methods and uh, create uh, some sort of division among the data set to be able to uh, get an understanding of what's in that data set and then to allow it to either make classifications or to generate some other content from it. Uh, so in, in this image here, you can kind of see like that representation of taking like a variety of data points and then being able to like split them up. And then on the right side, you can see that uh, there's a variety of data representations um, for the same type of data, right? So you can take like 3D data and transform it into like a 2D uh, flying version or some other way to represent that data, maybe like in a time series. So what is representation? 
uh, the descriptor, the description or portrayal of something in a particular way or as being of a certain nature. So this is like one of the most, I guess, important parts that you can say about what kind of data we could feed into these networks. Um, so one part we can use vision, we can use audio and then other types of data like tabular data. Um, in the case of vision, uh, we usually have uh, images, audio, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, video audio, um, or uh, some other uh, thing that represents like a visual aspect. And these get translated into what we call tensors, um, and they can be captured uh, through these like numbers, as you can kind of see here in the pixels, right? So each number will represent like a different uh, color, uh, and they can range in the spectrum uh, between like uh, RGB uh, colors. Um, then you have audio, and these are usually represented in some sort of frequency. Um, and these are patterns that work through time. So in, in a way, they're also like time series based. Uh, and we can sort of uh, feed that into a machine by using a time series sequence. Uh, and then data uh, included here, which is kind of more of a overall, like general aspect of it. Um, where it could it kind of be anything, it could be any type of data, and it's usually something like it could be uh, financial data, uh, tax data, or like even like likes or, or something that uh, records something in the real world, and it could be uh, placed in a tabular form. Uh, another way, at least for us visual people and uh, architects, uh, is 3D representations uh, of data. And some of this, as you can see, is it can be split into two parts, the Euclidean structured data and non-Euclidean. Uh, in the Euclidean structured data, you can have something like projections, uh, RGBD, which is the RGB uh, image plus the depth map, uh, and then volumetric, which is voxels or octrees, and also like multi-view uh, cameras, which is uh, essentially taking an image of a 3D object and encapsulated in uh, images or uh, compressing that data into images. And then on the other side, you have point clouds uh, and then you can have meshes. We can also translate that into graphs. So uh, artificial intelligence is it's any method that generates human-like intelligence. And then under that, you can have machine learning which is uh, methods that use statistics and math to learn. And then within that, you can have deep learning, which is just adding uh, multiple layers of uh, hidden net, uh, neurons uh, to be able to process uh, information. And you can kind of see like how it began, like Alan Turn proposes like a test for art, uh, to test for artificial behavior. And then in the 1950s, they start developing some um, some uh, types or like some simple ways of like generating classifications and then expert in symbolical uh, systems developed. And then more recently in the 90s, machine learning starts where they started using statistics. And then as a more recent, uh, thanks to big data and just the, the increase of computation, then you can do deep learning. And re more recently, now you have something like the clip and Dolly model that combines uh, deep learning with text and images. So right here in this image, you can see the wide variety of like network architectures. Um, and they can send something from like a very uh, simple perceptron here, uh, which just has one hidden layer, uh, two nodes, and then a feed forward network, which is usually the what do you would call like the beginning of like the deep forward network. And, and that would be sort of like the you know, like typical like convolutional neural net or, or any other sort of uh, network that uses uh, many hidden layers. Um, there's also other interpretations like for recurrent networks, um, long short-term memory, and these are more for processing like series of data. And then as a more recently part of this family is uh, transformers, which uh, they started off by being applied to uh, natural language, uh, but then now has shifted into other areas since they proved they're pretty, uh, powerful that could not be used in vision and other domains. Uh, and then sort of like the ones that are people more familiar with, like uh, maybe like variational autoencoders, which these could be used for generate uh, generative networks. And then you also have the GANs here, 
uh, which is the general adversarial networks. Um, so you can kind of see just how, depending on how you structure the hidden network, uh, the hidden nodes, uh, how you can generate different networks. And uh, the structure actually depends on what they're used for, but you can see that there's an overall idea of like connectionism. Uh, and this is something that was, um, you can kind of compare it to how uh, neurons in your brain work. And, and you can say like, maybe there's some connection between that, the biological process, and then this artificial process that is uh, developed by humans to uh, be able to process uh, information. On uh, semantic. So semantic is so words of language connected with meaning. It's usually uh, tend to be words that are semantic units that commit, convey some type of meaning. So it's some sort of uh, encapsulation of a object in a from a representation. Uh, so here we have like a semantic understanding, right? And what you can see is like you can start from like let's say this color image here. Uh, and then we can do also now like classification. Um, so it can get tell us like, based on a variety of examples, like, oh, this is like a basket of fruit, or this is a street. And then we go one step beyond that. And then we can sort of begin to highlight like where specific objects are located within these images. And then we can go to another step, which is like the actual segmentation and pixel space of like those objects. And after that, then you have semantic segmentation, which essentially is able to pick out those individual objects in the image, but also uh, correlate them with their actual uh, textual representation or some way that describes this object. And, and that's that's kind of like the uh, most interesting and important, I think, useful part of what we get into with these types of networks. And uh, you can see that from the clip model. So what is CLIP? CLIP is, uh, as Daniel Ross explained, is a way to uh, process uh, text and image in pairs, uh, and then be able to use that in a way where you can fit, feed forward an image, uh, and then it would output like a description of that image. And what's different from this versus like a traditional classification model is like a typical uh, classification model would just output um, kind of like a, let's say like a vector. So if it's like a dog, if it's like a cat or, or like some, or if it's like a bus, whereas this one is actually generating, like it could generate like a textual output and it could sort of describe what's in the image. So that's what makes it uh, more powerful and like really interesting to use as it builds like some sort of segmentation map between text and image. Uh, in, uh, in a study that OpenAI did uh, with CLIP, they were looking to see how different words uh, or semantic uh, meaning can be uh, displayed in like the neurons that were actually in the CLIP model, so in, in the hidden uh, network neurons. And you can kind of see here how, depending on what the word is, there's like a some sort of representation that gets encoded in the clip model. And when you're trying, the way that they did is just by optimizing, let's say the weights that represent this, uh, this word, uh, they were able to find some sort of correlations uh, in like the visual output that kind of uh, represent those things. Uh, what's interesting about this is that you could get a lot of interesting output from this, right? Um, but there's also opportunities where there might be um, kind of like where the model can fail. Uh, and one example is like if you give, for example, like the word money uh, to like the model, uh, it could be represented in very ways. So there's not like maybe sometimes like a clear delineation of what is the exact representation. So you can deviate from that a lot. So um, it's interesting to like, just keep that in mind. Like they train this in uh, millions and millions of uh, paired text and images from the internet. Uh, so depending on that data set, it could have some sort of bias or like some sort of uh, variance based on, uh, on like the meaning. Following that uh, comes the DALI model where uh, it's a 12 billion parameter version of GPT-3. Uh, trained to generate images from text descriptions using a data set of text image pairs. 
Uh, so GPT-3 is a language, uh, a, a natural language processing model based on transformer architecture. Uh, and, and it was like proven to be like really successful at being able to generate sequences of text and understand text. Um, and here on the right, you can kind of see some of the examples that Dali uh, kind of produces uh, from OpenAI where they wrote like an arm chair and shipping an avocado and you can see some of the generation. Um, the other side here on the right, uh, which I, th I found more interesting is that you can tell it like, for example, a stack of three cubes, a red cube is on top. And uh, those sort of very specific, uh, I guess, directions and language, uh, it can sort of begin to approach, uh, which could be useful in, in, in another sort of domains. Um, so finally, like to understand, um, I guess like the difference between like semantic, uh, let's say processing and other more uh, types of styles of uh, neural networks, for example, like you have the neural style transfer where you can take one image um, or one initial image and then have a sort of style image and then have these two images uh, joined together to output like a, a stylized version of the original image. Uh, this one doesn't keep um, the semantic aspect of it, uh, and I'll show that in a, an example on the next slide. Um, but then you have this one clip now, when, when you introduce clip that you have an image, and then it will output like a textual description of that image. And then you can combine that with a generative model, in this case like VQGAN clip, and you can have now text, audio, plus image, and then it can generate an output image. Uh, so here are some examples of that. So you can see uh, here at the top, like when you're a style transfer that you have, let's say this initial image plus a stylized image, and then it's just gonna transfer that onto that image. Uh, so it doesn't it doesn't change the original image, it's just kind of overlaying the style on top. Um, clip here uh, takes this image and then it could output like the top you know, top uh, number results that describe this image. And you can see kind of here what's interesting is that it like from the knowledge that it's acquired from the internet, it knows that, oh, impressive architect, Saha building or sculpted impressive building. So it's pretty good at deciphering those things. Um, and then finally here, this example, uh, this one you can have the VQGAN uh, clip model and then input a text. And then you can also add some other uh, text to it that can be weighted. Um, in, in that sense, like you can change how much impact you want it to have on the final output. And then you can have these sort of generations where like now it's actually generating objects based on this text in a semantic way versus just copying the style. Okay. Um, and then based on that, like since like prompt now becomes like the important way to generate things, uh, there's been sort of studies online where people have figured out how to include different pre-prompts um, and, and those different pre-prompts can generate like a completely different stylized output uh, from Clip, right? And some of the famous ones is like you can use like Unreal, like render in Unreal Engine or hyperrealism or uh, something like ambient occlusion uh, and then those sort of once you input those into the model and you can kind of play around with them later on uh, when uh, mayor goes over the tutorial they can generate like completely different uh, stylized versions which, which is kind of fascinating that clip can understand where those images are coming from uh, and then another aspect is like you can connect it now with audio as uh, daniel russ has mentioned um and, and this is just kind of like taking that clip base and then guiding it with audio and then it an output image um, uh, this here is an example of generating like an uh, image based on that uh, like audio that was uh, created by Lorena. So she created the audio and then input it into the audio clip and generated this image. So one interesting aspect to note um, is that with audio, since it's like slightly different than text, it uh, has a different representation, but at the same time, the way that let's say the model is interpreted is that it, it also knows like 
what kind of objects to pick and what colors to pick. Um, and the color part, I found it fascinating because depending on what audio you pick, it's, it can change the color. And the colors seem to be, uh, in, in a way, I don't know, you can say maybe related to what the sound is. So that's another aspect that might be fascinating to explore later on. Uh, and then creativity. So the use of imagination, original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. So uh, based on since like clip models where you combine with generate model can generate a whole bunch of image output. Um, the question is like, you know, like is the model creative, right? Like how does it, how can it generate these things? And that might be like a question up for debate. Um, but then you can kind of see here, and I wanted to show this image. This is how the, uh, the BQGAN uh, paper describes how their model works, right? And um, you can see they can take an image, uh, then compress it to some sort of encoder uh, to compress that information and then produce uh, what they would call like a notebook, a uh, codebook, which is a representation of this image in some sort of um, a vectorized form that can be fed into a transformer uh, to produce like the next sequence of that image or like the next, let's say, uh, area of that image. Uh, so this is how the VQGAN model works in a way. Uh, but what's interesting is like, if you think about like, is this actually creative or is it just kind of like a, some sort of computational process that based on the variety of uh, input data that we can sample from, it just seems like it's creative based on those combinations of all that data. Um, and then like, this is a kind of like more simplified version of what it means to encode the representation. So if you have text and audio, uh, and then you combine it with image, you have this pair encoding, and then the representations are, are learned in some sort of uh, space, right? So usually what happens is that you have, let's say two uh, representations that are similar in, in nature, uh, they'll be closer to each other in this learned space. And then the more different one would be slightly separated. So the, these models are kind of optimized to induce uh, those construct, uh, const, constructive differences. Uh, and finally, uh, this is a, a overview diagram of how you can connect the clip model to any sort of generator and how it sort of works in, uh, as it generates this sort of uh, iterative process. So encode the text and audio into clip uh, so clip is going to encode that and then you can take the generator which is going to generate some sort of image and then it's going to get encoded into clip and then it's going to take those two um, inputs and then output a vector representation uh, this vector in the case of clay could be like a 10 uh, thousand by uh, 1024 uh, numbers that represent that uh, image or text and then that gets send down to a, what we call a, a cosine similarity function, which just is just used to measure the distance between the two outputs. And then it's gonna calculate that is distance to then go back and update the weights uh, to generate an image that looks closer to the input of text for audio. Uh, so uh, originally, uh, as Daniel Russ explained, uh, one of the, I guess you can kind of trace back this uh, process from uh, one of these original works by Alexander Morvinsev, which he was the creator of Deep Dream. Uh, and uh, in this sort of uh, approach, uh, what he was doing is just optimizing uh, sort of like the classes uh, found in like an image set uh, in a CNN, right? Uh, but um, what he was trying to do is just kind of see if he can get all those classes optimized and generate some sort of output from from that. Um, and this one doesn't include any semantic meaning, uh, as you can kind of see, it's just like a uh, sort of collage of various, uh, let's say, uh, activations found in a CNN uh, or in the ImageNet classification model. And then uh, later on, uh, Ryan Murdoch, he was able to uh, combine CLIP with like Big Gan and guide it. And once that was kind of worked out, then you can now input like a prompt and then it's going to generate some sort of image on that. Um, so Ryan, I, I saw in an interview that he actually quotes kind of like this is uh, the deep dream is like the inspiration for his work. And that's why he calls it like the pig sleep.
Uh, and then uh, another thing to note, it's, um, for example, uh, Catherine Crossan. Uh, she's also another contributor to these wonderful uh, clip uh, model notebooks. Uh, she was playing around with like clip draw, and then you can kind of see what it could generate from that. Um, and then I also experimented with Dolly and then used a prompt called a fractal universe. You can kind of see what it generates from that. So it, it does generate some very interesting output. And this is the whole idea of questioning, like, is this like a, a creative uh, model? Like, is this actually doing something creative that uh, we can consider as humans? And then uh, what makes Clip interesting and what uh, Daniel Ross was mentioning is that you can now have the clip as like a sort of, in a way, a uh, guide, guiding process to any sort of generated network, right? Um, and you, they can like plug into that. And you can also guess dependent on how you configure the output, you can also uh, change what kind of things outputs from this. Uh, so that's kind of like one of the most interesting parts about this and uh, what Dolly and like Ryan Murda kind of open up to the world by making it work. And finally, I wanted to leave you with this. This is a newer work that uses clip, but in a more, I think, more way related to the real world uh, where they can connect now clip, use their its semantic backbone um, to be able to have a robot arm uh, move things based just on text uh, input. So somebody speaking, uh, so somebody can say what they want the robot arm to do, and the robot arm is going to go ahead and do that. Um, so it was trained uh, very specifically on uh, several tasks, um, but it's kind of fascinating that once you have like the clip backbone, uh, it can be applied to other domains. Um, so I wanted to leave you guys with that and then just think about like, what else can this be applied to? Um, I mean, this is kind of just started like it was just released like in, within the last year. So we're still kind of in the early stages. So who knows what's going to happen in like five years. Um, so yeah, so that, that's my presentation for that. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. I this was like amazing presentation. You compiled a lot of different things and gave us like a crash course of AI for creativity. Great work. So if you have any questions uh, related to uh, this presentation or clip, you can start uh, posting on uh, the Zoom comments or YouTube. And uh, Daniel and I will try to address uh, during the implementation. Okay, Mary, I'm going to stop sharing. Yep. Okay. So a uh, few things um, I would like to say uh, why Clip uh, changes the whole game, like, according to my opinion, is earlier when uh, you were experimenting with style gen models or other uh, AI models, uh, we had a proper like a data set which you use for training and then the inference of after the train model uh, is based on that data set. And there were discussions about biasness and uh, creativity of those uh, GAN models where it, it has learned based on the data we have provided. The, the thing which differentiates CLIP is uh, it's a contrastive learning method, which Daniel um, showcased that even if in the data set, so clip is uh, like trained on billions of parameters and there are GAN models who are trained on Wikipedia uh, art. And so it has learned all the words and all the descriptions uh, with paired with the images. And the, the moment it gets interesting is uh, you don't, uh, there are pre-trained models and it's combining text and images. So let's say, uh, in the image training data set, the, the model has not seen an uh, image of an orange. But because uh, it knows the meaning of orange, it could generate, like based on the mapping of text and image, the translation uh, will able to generate uh, something at the end. So that's uh, one thing to keep in mind that 
you could start and give any prompt and it will generate something so without like you can combine multiple domains multiple disciplines and uh it's a new way of uh human machine cre uh, creativity so hey, yeah hey mayor uh there's a question here uh by movement sue says do you know any are there any techniques model that can convert vq gang clips output to 3d model um so i think that's kind of what daniel russell was explaining that he's kind of working on um there is some work between, I guess, outputting like a mesh, right? But it's kind of hard because Clip wasn't trained on 3D things. Uh, it's just based on image and text. So the outputs from that, you kind of have to do a lot of, uh, uh, let's say like tricks to be able to like get some sort of representation of a 3D object into an image that then you can pass it through Clip and then update the weights on that to regenerate like a 3D mesh. Um, there's also like a 3D mesh, point clouds, uh, and then uh, more recently neural radiance fields, uh, which are a little bit more complicated, but they're kind of fascinating too because they can represent a scene and they don't rely on geometry. They rely more like on uh, points on, in uh, space that, represent, uh, that are represented by color and opacity, right? Uh, and you can generate like a very complex scene with that. Um, and there's some people that have experimented with that already, but I don't think it's like at this stage where we can just go in and use it because it's like very complicated to connect the two together. Yeah, that's right. And so there are like two workaround uh, in order to do that. So either you can use Clip Plus VQGAN to generate like text to image and do some post-production techniques where you use another AI model for depth map. So it generates like which objects are in front and back and then use that depth map image combined with uh, your output image to generate like point cloud and 3D models. Or you could just have like a conversion of text to vertices in like voxel space and you are predicting like, uh, those vertices. All right, so um, uh, Daniel, you can continue answering question in the chat and I'll start with the implementation part. So let's create something. So I hope you are able to see my screen. So uh, it's uh, it's a, a collective production, and uh, one thing which uh, you will notice is once OpenAI or any like big institution start like sharing models, the creators, uh, based on their curiosity and prompts, start manipulating the models, which even the developers had not expected. So in our workshop, we saw a workflow where participants were like using Sketch. Uh, for style transfer and then different rendering styles and they were able to generate a uh, different like uh, architecture renderings just from scratch so we are here for like uh, like if if you are experimenting uh, during the workshop or after the workshop and you would like to share your prompt and image uh, I'll, i'm sharing this link so you could uh, start populating in the chat all right so first uh we will uh, start with apart from text to image so as uh daniel uh showcased in uh, his work you could also create like animations and morphing so we will uh, do our first experiment how you can just use text to create like walkthrough animation panning and like there's whole another possibilities. So I'm sharing this collab link. Maybe you also want to show how like they have to save a copy and drive. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. yeah. Oh. Sorry. Uh, you can see the link in the chat, right? Okay, yeah, you can also follow along so uh, we can know if uh, there is any hurdle. So first uh, thing you can, uh, you will do is in the file, save a copy on drive for the link I shared. You create another instance. So 
first um, if you if you don't have collab uh, pro account you can just r run one script at a time so if and if you are using other scripts you can just terminate here and after doing that uh, in the runtime type uh, ensure it's gpu and not none you can also use gpu but it will help in faster computation so that's uh, step two and basically what are we trying to do here using collab is machine learning models uh, are developed uh, using like uh, python libraries and there are trained models shared on github so basically we are using a uh, collab which uh, a resource by google where we are like using a virtual computer to install those uh, python libraries to download those trained model and this is an interface where we'll be doing experiment and generating results you could also do this in your own local computer but uh, you need to go through like steps of uh, proper installation and workflow so it, we will be just using a uh, collab for this workshop so first uh, i would like to thank uh, the contributors hot grids uh, it's the discord name on uh, he uh, shared the script and it also like this work is developed uh, from starting from uh, big n plus clip by edwan and then daniel russell catherine added their code on top of it so uh, the next step is just press run all because these are like heavy uh, models and library so it will take time to download and install so we will be doing uh, that so that's quite important run all and i have like hidden the complex part of the code but i'll also go through the important aspect so what this is showing first is like this is the gpu which we are being assigned by google so it, it might be different depending on the uh, availability you have. So first it's like cloning, taming transformer. So as Daniel mentioned earlier, we have a clip, we need a generator. And taming transformer is, uh, is giving us like the VQGAN part in downloading from GitHub here like there are different trained vqgan models so we are currently using imagenet f16 and 16384 so f16 means like we are uh, as you saw in the image it divides the image into 16 uh quant quantized and 16384 is the length of one one divided uh vector and there are various models where there are like f16 and 800 of vector points so depending on uh your uh your priority some uh people might have like faster inference over quality inference so and there are different domains as well so we are using image net which has seen quite generalized uh images in their uh, training data set. There are other models like Wikiart. So depending on what kind of theme and uh, domain exploration you want in your generated images, you uh, select that train model. So hopefully like you in your screen, it would be this three hidden uh, code. So first would be like installing this. It might be installing modify and activate clip. So meanwhile, it's installing. So basically, uh, in this, we are injecting uh, what are the image transformations uh, we will do while training. So simple, like the way this work is, we are using clip to guide 
the VQ GAN. So every GAN is like generates images from a random noise and clip has the semantic knowledge. So instead of providing a random seed to the GAN to generate an image, we are using clip, which will guide, okay, based on the prompt, uh, the generated image doesn't align with the text semantic. So then the loss uh, will be like the loss and uh, aspect would be modified. So the VQ GAN generation aligns with the uh, text prompt we gave. So clip is like a image text matcher and VQ GAN is like the image generator. And there are like different data augmentations and manipulation, uh, image augmentation and manipulation, uh, uh, in, which is being done in this part of the code. Then we are activating clip and here is the fun part. So uh, what are different inputs? So you might be just seeing this part. If you double click, uh, it will also show the code. So we are giving like a main prompt, which is the text you wanna generate. We are giving the steps. So each step, VQ can generate an image, goes to clip, uh, do ask like see the loss, and then it's modifying every step to generate an image. This is display frequency, like the number of times uh, it will be displayed in this output. And you could change, like if you change it to 10, like every 10th image generation, it will be displayed. But like to say you compute and memory, so you uh, you decide a number which uh, it's comfortable for you. So that is for static part. You generate an image, uh, do the training. But if we want to create animations, we could, like for every generation, we could guide the future generations with these parameters. So rotation will do like for here, the parameter is modify every 10. So it generates 10 images. And now for the 11th image, it will look at this transformation parameter that uh, are we guiding to rotate, zoom, pan. And based on that, from 11 to 20th image, it will do training on that uh, modified tra image transformation. Then for 21st image, it will again look at these parameters. So uh, you can uh, decide uh, this, like ideally uh, I keep it from 10 to 50. So you can uh, experiment with that. So rotation will lead to like, obviously like rotating uh, the frames in generation and you could, it's in degrees just to keep in mind. Shear angle is sharing the future image transformation. X panning is yeah, panning in X direction, Y is panning in Y direction, and zoom uh, is one, which will keep the image as it is. And so this slider I have kept between 0.95 to 1.05, because if you go like three, it's so much zoomed in that the image generator has not uh, understand uh, the the previous transformation. So if you want like a zoom in, uh, you keep it like 1.04 or like between one to 1.05. If you want to zoom out, you can keep it uh, from 0.95 to one. So just for the initial uh, experiment, uh, we I have kept no, no zoom, like just one and Y panning to two. So it will just like take the current images and it will start moving up. If you want to do like X panning, you keep, you modify this parameter and it will generate like X panning in X direction. If you want to do both like panning in X as well as zooming, you modify this parameter and click here again. So looks like, um, it has generated a video. And if you want to see all the like images generated, so if you click on this folder, in this is the uh, 
content we downloaded from GitHub in the first part of the code. And inside this folder, there's an output folder, which has all these generations. And uh, it uh, this part of the code generates a video out of all these frames. So once you double click it, you can download that video. And this is like we did for panning in Y direction and it's doing that. So all for the next future iterations, all you need to do is uh, modify this parameter and start uh, uh, like playing with either the rotation shear and all these parameters for animation. Is anyone facing any uh, issues in running the collab? So one one uh, thing uh, to keep in mind is there are a lot of things you could do, but just for simplicity, I have not provided that in the interface. Where uh, if I like uh, uncomment pre prompt, you could also like have pre prompt here. And we could also start with an image prompt. So once you get into it, there are a lot of things you could play with. Daniel, was that like clear enough or? Yeah, no, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's fine. I don't know if anybody, if anybody has questions, Amir, but, um, I can I, I I was I had done some uh, I don't know if you want to share this but it's like um, I have done some tests that explain kind of how like the augmentation process works before you feed it into Clip and mm -hmm. and I have like an example of images that kind of show that I, I don't know if we if if that would make it easier to see like because the way that it gets processed like through the the cutout method right like there's like a cutout function mm -hmm. yeah. that it'll take your image and then it'll generate like copies of it but it'll apply augmentations that would get encoded in the in the pqgan model to represent your image right um so, so i don't know if that might be helpful to show yeah um yeah i i think we can uh until people are experimenting we can just show uh, i have another collab which I want to just quickly run through because this is producing uh, like a particular aesthetic which is different than like this collab. It has more realistic part. So yeah, you can sh share the data augmentation and then we can jump in. Uh, Mayor, somebody asked if you can send those links again. Sure. Yeah, I'm just gonna like kind of show real quick like what happens when we talk about like how VQ get encodes it and like why it needs to be encoded, right? Like how it breaks it down into like individual pieces. Um, so you can fit it into the clip model. So in the the way to sort of encode these images is like first of all, you have to like normalize them um, because clip was done under like a certain normalization. So that's kind of like one of the important parts about it. So you, it has to match kind of like, in a sense, like how the colors look in the clip model. Uh, and then you can apply augmentations to it here. And like, you can do like horizontal flip, rotation, or erase in random parts, or even like perspective. And then there's a function that takes like the image that you input and cuts it up into like batches, right? Or like into uh, parts. In this case, it could be like 32. Um, and, and what that does, like once you run through this, is that you'll get this sort of tensor. And, and the way that the tensors work is like you have 32, which represents a total amount of images. And then three, this is for the number of channels. So like RGB. And then 24 by 24 
it's just the height and width of the image, so in pixels. Uh, and then you would take that image, for example, and then you run it through the VQGAN model and encode. Uh, so it'll take that image and encode it, and then it would output this vector uh, in Z space, right? Um, and uh, that represents your image. Uh, so it, it gets compressed to this representation. Um, and then, for example, if we look at it, if you decode the image, which that's what uh, the model does, after you encode it, uh, it sort of tries to generate like a similar image based on the original one. Uh, so after compression, it can sort of uh, generate the image based on that compressed uh, code. Uh, and then if we take a look at those augmentations, uh, the 32 augmentations that it does, um, what it's doing is like taking this image and like applying all of these things to it, um, right? And like rotating it, flipping it, uh, removing parts from it. Um, and the reason for this is because like we want the model not just to like kind of memorize the image, but we want it to like capture some invariant aspects about the image. So some parts that don't change, right? And, and it's trying to learn like what exactly is like the parts of the image that are like don't change no matter what we do to it. Um, and so that's kind of how that process works. And then you can look at that and you can see like, these are kind of like just the activations that it learns from those images. Um, so once it gets encoded, these are the, let's say the parts of the image that the model says, like the brighter ones is like the ones that it says, oh, this is kind of what gets activated the most once you run it through the encoding process. Um, so yeah, so, so that's kind of what I wanted to show. I think that might be a little bit helpful to see what it's kind of doing under the hood. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, so imagine like this uh, vector quantization is different than like convolutional neural network where you have the slider and convolutional neural network helps in mm -hmm. learning adjacency. And also like your object will look different if you look from front side or it's at different scale or zoomed out. So we need machine to learn that. So this kind of augmentations and morphing not only like provides like one particular uh, view of learning, but also it makes it independent and scale invariant. Right. Awesome. Right. And uh, just to clarify, uh, this uh, augmentations are happening for the generation in BQGAN part, the modify every 10, like the animation we are generating, it's, yeah, it's uh, for every 10 seconds. All right, so hopefully everyone generated their first uh, animation and clip plus VQGAN video. So the next step is you just change uh, this prompt and start uh, running this. So you don't need to run everything, just... Uh, Let me modify this and let's say we want the rotation and panning and there you go. That's it, nothing else. So looks like we don't have any comments yet about any errors, so we are good to go. So I'll, I'll give a quick run through of this model and I'll share it again. So this has a uh, relatively different aesthetics. So I'm sharing in the chat. Oh no, not this one. So yeah, meanwhile, I open this link. So hugging uh, face, is an amazing uh, community where they are open sourcing and making this models accessible. So if anything is not working, you could also do experiment here. And uh, you can also start with an image and a text prompt. The, the thing to consider is like, if more people are doing this activation, uh, you will be queued. So 
collabs helps you like one on one in friends here you are like sharing the same compared with anyone who is going to give this prompt so um all right so we are going to quickly show two more scripts one is uh, using that quantize method and daniel uh, will be showing how uh, you can scale up this uh, image resolution to uh, like higher and the reason uh, it's this image space is very complex so uh, they keep it low res 224 by 224 and so that the learning is uh, effective and fast because each pixel there is like 0 to 255 prediction and if you multiply it's like a very complex problem so let's dive into this You can access this link. Okay, I need to terminate. Yeah, you might also need to terminate uh, other sessions if it's well, okay. Let's do. So here the uh, quantization method is different for image generation compared to earlier. And that's how like uh, people do modifications in this workflow to like generate new content. So here the only uh, thing you need to change is the prompt section here and let's say this is the prompt we give so it's still Installing other libraries. So I was, uh, as I was talking earlier, so we were using uh, this uh, model from Wikigen ImageNet. There are also like thousand vector models also, which we can explain. This is still downloading. Hey, so, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if, like, later on, you want to just show, like, you know, what different models that you're downloading come from. Like, if you, uh, I guess, uh, the GitHub page. Oh, the yeah, like, yeah. yeah, just kind of like what different types of models these are being trained on. Because I think that's like for somebody that wants to play around, maybe they can get an sure, idea sure. of like the variety. Yeah. So, like, I just uh, use the link. Uh, in the collab from where the models have been downloaded. So here you could see a list of all the models which you could use for uh, pre-trained models. So depending on your like space exploration, so if you are more into phase and uh, generation through clip plus Wikigen, you might consider using uh, these two models, Celeb A and FFHQ. And also face so that HQ is a good one. We are currently using this too, but you can just modify the link in the collab and you can download these models as well. So yeah, if you yeah, if you can see if you are more into nature, uh, art generation, maybe Flickr would be a good one. If you are into generalized image net. Cool. Uh, Mary says that uh, okay. So how does how can someone get started? Is there oh, is this also dependent on platforms, Mac PC, and can you do this on your phone? 
Okay. You can uh, run collab on your phone, but it's not a good interface. But uh, do you mean uh, inference on collab or you can do this on your phone, this interface? And it's independent of like any operating system. You can do it Windows or Mac. Yeah, it's so uh, web based. Um, so that's what kind of makes it really uh, useful because uh, the, 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 let's say like the virtual environment that's being run to run all these processes is being like hosted on the cloud. Um, so uh, you don't, you can run it locally on your desktop, but uh, with like Colab, you can run it on the cloud and use GPUs. So, um, so that's kind of, that's very useful. Yeah. And especially like you can, you don't need to buy like heavy GPU, like expensive compute on locally. You could just, so the thing to uh, note is earlier, Google was giving like GPU and TPU for free subscription, but now like uh, it's difficult to get a, uh, uh, a good GPU for free. So people like you can use like pro version. Marin, another question is how is this a game changer? Like the generation or the compute or training we are doing? Both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. So uh, the possibilities of inter integrating this in the workflow are a lot. So I I did I used Clip Plus VQ again for a precedent study for in one of my studios where I was able to try and test different design concepts just from prompt. We could also uh, use it for uh, like production level and rendering also if. Uh, if you know the prompt, you can start with your basic uh, images and like uh, create walkthrough videos and everything. And people are experimenting in this space a lot. So uh, I am very optimistic and that in uh, soon we will see using Clip, you could create like 3D mesh models or point cloud model, which could like drastically reduce the time from your sketch, uh, the thought you had while sketching to the production level and like environment in Rhino, Revit or any 3D modeling uh, software you're using. Yeah, and I would say like also, um, I guess like one example that I could talk about where uh, there's been some interesting explorations is like in a previous uh, workshop that we did, uh, Ricardo uh, and uh, Fabio Asalte, they developed this sort of like pipeline where they could take like a sketch and plug it into like, Clip and VQ again. So starting from like a line sketch, uh, plug it in, and then based on a prompt, it would generate uh, like an image based on that sketch. So it can kind of build on top of the sketch and do like a rendering type style, like architectural object on top of that. Um, so there's some exploration in that, which is it's, it's fascinating that it can do that. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, based on the video that I showed previously with now you can uh, pretty much speak to a robot and then uh, it can uh, move objects based on what you tell it to because it's using clip to guide it visually. Um, I think there's probably gonna start being more applications developed around that, that stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I guess that's kind of like, uh, I mean, I think we're still early. Um, it, it literally just came out within a year. So it'll probably take a couple like maybe like two years or so where we start seeing some uh, pretty interesting stuff um, happening in this space. Um, also, there's, there's still kind of like a limitation that is only trained on like 2D images and text. So if people start going into uh, training it with other types of data, uh, that might also open up new avenues. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's interesting. And uh, one thing like uh, I found interesting is so let's say uh, if you are doing like a project on Mars or like completely new domain, which you don't have precedent study, I mean, this can open up uh, opportunities to try out different ideas because it has that semantic understanding of different domains. Yeah, and I think 
The other part about that is that you can also take kind of like a pre-trained clip model and then fine tune on top of that. So like if you have your own data set and I think uh, uh, Theodore, uh, what's his last, uh, I forget his last name, Theodore Galano? Yeah, that is, yeah. yeah. So he's been doing kind of like interesting stuff with this approach where he's taken, yeah, if you want to share his, uh, where he's taken um, like kind of like uh, representations of floor plans, right? And uh, and like outputting like a text that, uh, I guess like using text and like generate a floor plan from text. And like, if you see kind of like what is the sort of imp importance of using semantics uh, to generate things like this is kind of fascinating because uh, if you keep developing this type of approach and fine tuning it, it is possible to get to a point where you can develop, you know, floor plans just by telling it what to, what you want or like maybe like uh, a 3D model just by telling it what you want. Can Another you, question. What books or reference links can you recommend? Hmm. Uh, for I, I think uh, for clip knowledge the most of the learnings I had was through following people on Twitter and Discord how they are developing this what are different uh, changes in model they are doing it in clip and VQGAN space so I, I'm yet to come across a book just focused on like the clip but you can read research papers, which yeah. helps you get better understanding. You can, I guess like the, for Clip, obviously you can check out the open AI page. They have a, like a, a summary of what it does. Uh, and they also have a summary for Dolly and the, and all the other like kind of things that they're working on and related to this space. Um, but this is kind of like a wider topic in the sense that that they want to connect text to uh, image uh, because they feel that to build like a more robust artificial intelligence, it needs to know these things. And they're finding that by combining these two methods, then you can get better representations of real world things more similar to how human might uh, generate like knowledge and meaning. Um, so, so that's kind of like the first place that you can start. And but yeah, like Mayor said, like uh, we usually find it's like how these creative coders have been hacking it in a way, and they've been like adding their own augmentations or tweaking parts to it um, to make it work better. But I don't think there's like a documented paper or like tutorial where like it explains the whole thing. Since there's like there's like a wide variety of things that people have been doing, but one of the original people, like we said, was like Ryan Murdoch. He kind of developed a method uh, to use like a uh, big game with clip. And then that method is sort of based on how the Dolly model works, um, how it's connected. It, it's the same similar process, but he like tweaked it in a way that allowed him to do like more stylized or different sort of uh, visual outputs. Yeah, I, like just one thing to add is uh, it, there are a few blogs, but initially, even like when Daniel and I were exploring this space, we just had to sit down and like decode each and every aspect because those folks uh, are like computer scientists and they have ML backgrounds. So it was quite easy, but we had to understand each and every step and to uh, deploy it. Yeah, uh, I think like hugging face spaces are like amazing like way to if you are just starting out and interested to uh, deploy like experiment with different AI models. Even uh, you could experiment with GPT Neo, which is like open source version of GPT three, to maybe explore how you can use AI to write a research paper or a abstract or project description for your design. So it's amazing. Maybe uh, Daniel, do you want to show uh, the super resolution? Uh, yeah, so let me, let me just uh, uh, So I, we have a question that uh, walking through the paper and mathematics. So I made 
like a video on my YouTube channel about how clip works and the basically going through a key aspect of the paper. So we could check out, but definitely uh, we could plan more theoretical discussions for future. I'll please show it briefly. <laughs> So I'm sharing our content. Do you have the collab or? Uh, yeah, do you want to share the, I don't know, since to share the paper, or I don't know if you want to share that real quick and I'll, I'll be loading up the collab. The Sargan one? I, I don't know, he said um, link to, uh, just uh, find the link. Oh, please show it quickly. Which? Sorry, I didn't get you. Which link are you referring? All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, meanwhile, he types, I guess I'll, I'll show the, the RE as research. Okay, and let me share this. Okay, I'm sharing the notebook in the chat. So, um, so this notebook that I'm gonna run through is called the Real ES Bargang. Um, and what it allows to do is that you can um, input like a low resolution image and it's gonna like upscale it. And, and it does its best to like maintain uh, like a, good resolution or like a very high quality. Um, so this was trained on like a, a lot of images. Um, and uh, it's, uh, so like, I guess same process, like if you wanna use it, um, do file and then save, copy and drive. Uh, so you can have it in your Google Colab drive. Uh, and then I'm just gonna run through it real quick. Um, so same thing, you, you're gonna use the, installation process here. So this will download uh, all the dependencies uh, and it's running there. Uh, so, so that usually takes a little bit of time because what it's doing is downloading the uh, GAN model from, from uh, GitHub and then it's installing all the dependencies that it needs uh, and, and downloading also the pre-trained models. Okay, so now you have that. Um, now, this part here is where you can upload like an image or you can also upload uh, a video, right? Um, so I'm just gonna do an image because the, the video part takes a little bit of time, but it's essentially the same process. So if you click here, uh, it's gonna open up this little uh, uh, 
window here or like the little text box here it says choose files um and then you can go to for example i'm gonna pick uh, let's see if So I'm gonna like, uh, I don't know which one. All right, let me try this one. Okay, so this image here. Um, and this image is that um, it's a smaller scale image. So it's, uh, I think it's a 512 by 512 image. Um, and then we can run that. This cell is for the video, so we don't have to run this cell. Uh, so just this part here is the image one. Um, and then once you have that, then you can hit the next bar. You can go straight to inference. So this part here from, um, let's say this cell here is the video cell. This is to upload your video. This one is to uh, put the location of the video. And then this one is, uh, this one processes the video. So it gets all the frames from the video into images, right? Uh, and that's how you can infer those um, or like run the inference process on those images so they can be um, uh, made into high resolution. So you need images in order to be able to run the model. Okay, so now once you have that, then you can go to the inference step. Um, and then here you can just run this. Uh, and then it's going to go and uh, get your image and then uh, I'll put like a bigger scale of that image. Uh, here you can change it to uh, the, the net scale and the out scale. So if you change this, depending on what size you want, you can go uh, four times bigger than your resolution or three times. So you can change these parameters. Um, just like kind of be aware that if you do go higher or if you want to do a video, uh, the bigger you go or the more frames you have, uh, your Google Colab would probably crash out um, just because of memory issues. This is this is like a, it does take a little bit of memory to run this process. Um, so once you have that, then you can run to visualization. And then you can see the output. Uh, so this was the original image, 512 by 512. I mean, I'll just run this cell here. Um, so this is the original image. So you can see that it's like a little bit um, more blurry. There's more blurriness to it. Uh, whereas this one, the output, uh, you can see that like it's a little bit more cleaned up and smoothed out. Uh, and this is four times the size of the original image. Um, and then once you have that, you can just go hit click here and download like your images. And then if you go to the panel here, uh, you can see uh, where all the results are. So if I just click here, uh, the image should pop up here. So you can see like it's really like now up in higher resolution. And then if I go to my inputs, uh, I think it's Oh, I think the input's got the but yeah, so that's how you can kind of get uh, an output image of higher resolution from an original lower scale uh, image. Uh, and the same process applied to videos, except that instead of outputting a single image, you're gonna start outputting a whole bunch of uh, images and frames. And then if you run the process uh, with videos, you can pre-compile it here by running this cell and it's gonna return a video in higher resolution um, based on your original video. So that's, that's that. Awesome. Uh, Daniel, I realize it's almost like one and a half hour mark. Okay. So we could do some conclusion. <laughs> we could go on and on because there are a lot of interesting collab scripts, but uh, it might be information overdose. 
Cool. Uh, so any any questions? I would also uh, like would like to share is Theodore uh, has started design intelligence uh, where uh, he's like reviewing weekly AI research papers. So if you want want to get started and learn more about the theory and uh, detail like model implementation aspect, I would encourage you to join that Discord. Uh, excuse me, Meyer, would you mind showing your video that you talked about explaining clip real quick? quick. And then how, how does one, let's say an uh, architect or student wants to learn more yeah. about how to do what you do, how, how do you find these papers? Where do you go? I'm not, I'm a designer. I don't know where to find these. And then how do you deconstruct it or think about it with your collaborators? If you don't mind going through that quick. Yeah. So one thing uh, I, I must admit is there are like a lot of research work going on in AI every day. There are like new papers. So there are a few people uh, which I think Daniel, you and I like agree that uh, AK, his pet name is AK on Twitter, which we follow where he posts like uh, a lot of uh, important uh, papers from archive which is a platform of research papers. So a few of the ways uh, like we keep track on what's uh, cutting edge and latest in the research communities by following accounts like AK. And uh, there are also people on YouTube. So called Yanis Culture, then Machine Learning Street uh, Community. And they have like weekly news and also uh, AI paper uh, detail explanation, which uh, helps to get a good understanding about what's the purpose, how it's implemented, what are the core aspects. And then uh, the next step, uh, which I generally do is once I get the theoretical understanding, I read the paper and then I, I see if there is like a GitHub, uh, like open source script or model, I can tinker around it. And then once I start experimenting, I the next step I think is uh, what are the ways we could integrate this in the design workflow? Or I think sometimes interesting uh, workflow happens when we start combining different AI models out there. So as Daniel and I, uh, we once explored how once you get like clip image generation, we could add other models on top of it to get clip to like 3D model generations. So, and this is the video where uh, I must admit like Clip and Wikugain are, are very complex. So I was asking questions on this code and ultimately I got like, I, I need to go down and figure it out myself. And we had like a very long chat with Daniel and I, we were like working all night to figure this out. And then we like uh, made a video of how it works and how we understand Clip works. So, Thank you, hey, Daniel. How do you, how did you get into coding, and why is why is it so important for us to learn all this? Uh, well, I got so I got into coding because of Grasshopper, and then I realized that you could do awesome things with Grasshopper, and and it was kind of cool to see that you can modify three dimensional uh, objects, right? And then once I got into Grasshopper, then I got into Python, and then once I got into Python, I kind of realized that if like there's a certain like I find, I just find it fascinating, like intelligence. So that the fact that like, you know, there's this kind of like machine learning aspect of like how to like, how can you uh, create intelligence in a computational way? Um, and how, how can you make that happen in a way that it can make decisions based on data? Uh, so I got into that and then I did uh, a master's in computer science, Georgia Tech. And then I just got really into understanding like how exactly does machine learning work? Um, and uh, it's like a fascination of mine. Uh, I just find it fascinating that you can develop all these models, encapsulate all these, uh, like all this knowledge 
and then be able to produce either classification or any sort of useful result at a big scale. Like, cause I think that's kind of the more interesting part of like creating these models is that you can deploy them at scale. And like, we see kind of like big tech companies that are now doing that at big scale. So that's a fascinating part about this tech. Um, and the way that I kind of keep up with it, it it's kind of hard. And, and what I started doing is like, I usually uh, either follow like conference papers. So like, there's like kind of like top um, like AI conferences, like Neurips, uh, iClear, then you have the, uh, what is this? Uh, the computer vision one, Mayor? Say, uh, say graph. Uh, the other one, the CVPR, right? CVPR, yeah. Yeah, CVPR is like another uh, big conference. So I try to like follow like kind of like what are the, some of the top papers or themes that emerge uh, from those conferences. Um, and then the people that Mayor was saying like on YouTube and then like Twitter. Twitter is fascinating because uh, there's like people on there that love to post their work in a visual way uh, and then don't give an explanation of what their paper is about. So I'll follow accounts on Twitter that are um, talking about their papers. Uh, and like one of the accounts is like the one that Mayor posted. Uh, and then there's other like uh, kind of like experts in the field that I follow, like Peter Bill, which he focuses on reinforcement learning and robotics. Um, and then I think Yan Lacoon also has a, he has a, a Twitter page. He doesn't post as much. And then Andres Kapathi, uh, he's the AI uh, director for like uh, for Tesla. And he posts some fascinating things, uh, like really cutting edge stuff. So like you can kind of, once you know who's kind of developing like things in that world, you can start following them on Twitter and they'll like kind of guide you through like other people that are also doing cool stuff. Um, the other part about it is like, if you really want to get down and understand it, you have to like either go through the code yourself and really and read the paper and try to like figure out how exactly these things are connecting in code um, and what is their output and input. Um, so that's another way. So thinking with code, reading the paper, and that'll give you like a better grasp of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And like Neuro, Neuro IPS has a special workshop on creativity, which uh, it's, I think it would be like uh, in December. So if you are interested and you want to see how other people are using uh, creative AI and doing research, uh, that is uh, the place to be. Uh, so we, we, we're, we're winding down, but uh, is there any code that you can show or any other functionalities that we as um, the very appreciative viewer can understand what are the next steps? Like, how should we think about this as designers and would be engineers and mathematicians? Like, what, what are we, what do we need to look for and what do we need to do? Yeah. So uh, I, I must say like, uh, first, like one, one must uh, try out uh, different things and identify their core strength because there are mediums out there which can let you work with AI model without coding as well. So if you check out Runway ML or there's like Google's uh, on-device training platform, there's Lobe AI where you could access these models but uh, and start playing with it without any coding. But the thing is, those models are being uh, updated at not at not the same pace as the machine learning com uh, community is producing those models. So you might be a bit behind if in those mediums. But I would just say, like, uh, yeah, attending workshops is quite uh, important. Like, if you want like some accelerated learning experience, where you could, they once they walk through the code, you understand why it works. Daniel, you want to add something? Um, 
Yeah, no, I think the what you said, kind of like just being able to attend workshops and like dive into it. And and it's like you can do the no code stuff. Like you can just get on, you know, like some platform that has no code options and like just plug in things and then get some outputs. Um, but if you want to get to like the level where you want to like tinker with it and like really, for example, like Daniel Russell, like he gets down to the very kind of like core of like how it processes and how these models connect. And then he can like test out new things, new ideas, and like maybe like different uh, outputs, like the way that he's outputting things. That's why he's able to like get like uh, 3D meshes or like point clouds now. And, and, and that's kind of like, if you really want to get to that level that you really have to like understand how it works, go deep in it, like know how to code. Uh, you won't find that in like a sort of no code platform. Um, that that kind of mostly depends on you and like all these people that are more like tinkers and hackers. Um, but I think, yeah, workshops and uh, just following like interesting people online that kind of post that. Uh, somebody asked like, is there any tutorials so you can implement BQ Gam plus Clip yourselves? Um, I think there might be on YouTube probably. I mean, but you can probably also find code now in GitHub, right? Like if you just type like on, on Google, you can say like PQ gang clip, like collab model. And like, you'll get like a model from that. And then maybe there's a tutorial to match it on YouTube. Um, but if you want to understand how it actually works, then you have to like kind of understand like the code. Um, otherwise you're just going to like run the cells and maybe not be able to change like a lot of the outputs. Um, and I think the other, I just wanted to add on top of that is that, for example, what Theodore is doing is like, he's able to like, train his own model now to a very specific domain uh, and he knows how to code and he understands the process so he, now he can deploy it in like architecture right and and that's kind of like fascinating where you can say like oh if people know how to do this uh then now they can apply it to the specific domains and this applies to any domain it could be like robotics architecture or anything that you can think of yeah definitely and like also like if you follow uh, i forgot to mention catherine Crowns and like uh, the Twitter ID is river, rivers have wings. And in that account, you will find collab script of all the cutting edge experiments. So you you could start experimenting and tinkering those models of like clip plus diffusion models are out there on the account. So if you are just doing like initial curiosity and exploration phase with creative AI, AI like collab, is like the least friction you could get to start experiment. And, and a lot of these models, they use PyTorch um, as like the framework or the language. So if you can, uh, I guess, do like some sort of, if you want to do like a crash course or like a starter course, like there's tons of information about PyTorch now. Um, and if you know how to like learn how to go with PyTorch uh, for like deep learning, uh, then that would be really helpful to be able to like tinker around with these models. Uh, uh, thank you, you guys. Is there, do you want to leave us with some code or collab uh, tips and tricks or something that we should uh, think about? Like maybe just summarize for the viewers that are coming in late, like, hey, how do we find you guys? Like, what's going on? I'm excited. Hey, I want to I wanna stalk you on Twitter. So how do, how do we do that? Do people find you on Twitter and look at your code? Do you post your code as well? Um, so like, uh, I make, uh, uh, small videos of, uh, AI research papers I read, which are interesting, which have, uh, interesting applications in architecture. It's on my YouTube channel called engineering architecture. And I also, uh, interview try, uh, experts who are pushing their boundary. So that is, that is one way I keep up to that matter. And you could like track that, but also like. Uh, we are active on Instagram and LinkedIn. If anytime you want to reach out and share some ideas you have related to creative AI and we could code and develop uh, or do some collaboration. Yeah, and I also, um, I, I don't post as much, but I do follow people on Twitter. I, I usually post like some of the things that I work on on Instagram, like visual things. Um, but I do use mostly like the Twitter just to engage with like people that are doing this type of work and I'll retweet some of the projects on Twitter 
that I find kind of interesting and in, in the way that maybe they're unique in certain domain areas. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm going to share my like account if you guys want to follow and you can see some of my retweets and see like the people that I repost is usually the people that are like kind of posting some of the most cutting edge stuff that is like kind of fascinating. And one thing I would like to also clarify that we also share a good amount of stuff related to blockchain and neuroscience. So it's, it's also we are exploring ways how we can combine these fields and have like multidisciplinary like models. So we're, 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 we're coming down on the wire. So I, I would say, what do you want to leave us with so that we, um, that we can really absorb what you guys have done? Because it's very impactful. I'm very impacted by how, by how the potential, but also just as a, as a novice, if someone just wanted to see, you know, um, uh, I saw the collab code. So is there something in the collab code that we should really identify right now or understand so that we can keep continuing our research independently? Yeah. So I, I must uh, say that uh, if you want to like take it to the next level, like having a good understanding of how PyTorch work and like coding and general understanding of how GAN model works, because if you if you are new to this and if you directly uh, dive deeper into that collab script, it, it's like uh, it might be very alien uh, thing. So it might uh, I would say if if you want if you are interested in developing this skill set, uh, start with like simple models and implement it yourselves on collab like style transfer, then go to style again, then uh, go to some natural language processing models, then clip multimodal and and then uh, once you reach that stage you first of all you'll feel more confident about like how it works and how to implement and then you can decode it and like tweak it as per your need yeah and i think uh i guess to add to that is like it's if you really want to get into it, like the mayor says like you have to like go into the code um there is some website uh some uh, github pages um uh, some guys that kind of like write a lot of this code in PyTorch. Um, one of them is like Lucid Rain. I, I don't know, maybe if you have that page, but like he has a wide range of implementations, of like all these sort of like new cutting edge models, um, and they're all in PyTorch. So like, if you want to take a look at the code of all these models, like you can just go to his page. He's like a great resource. Um, and then oh, the other thing that I wanted to add is that Mary and I did do a workshop uh, in July for the Digital Futures Inclusive, where we went over like kind of like a, a more detailed approach into like these models. We did uh, neural style transfer, uh, VQGAN clip, and the actual clip model. So like to be able to generate text from an image. Um, so uh, I think there might be a link in the chat where you can check out that playlist. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess the last thing that I can leave you guys with is like, I show the robotic arm uh, part uh, where you can kind of tell the arm what to do or like how to place objects. Uh, and it can take that and actually do uh, those actions, right? Uh, what's fascinating about that, if you think about like, what are the implications and how that can be applied to any other field and then how this thing can eventually uh, develop, it's kind of, fascinating at this stage that we're on, um, where we're now combining like these, all these multimodal uh, say streams of data into a deep learning model that can then make decisions uh, and they're humanly comparable. Uh, if we want to push that further, uh, probably within the next five years or so, we'll have pretty advanced and interesting things being done around the world. Um, so keep a lookout for that and you can always like, sort of look into these things and see if you want to like get involved with that. Um, OpenAI and DMine are great resources. Uh, they post a lot of content. Uh, so if you want to dive deeper, I would say like start there. Uh, they release a lot of very interesting uh, papers of like cutting edge uh, work in like a variety of domains from like unsupervised learning, self-supervised learning, reinforcement learning, 
uh, and things that can be uh, pretty impactful in the world. So, yeah. And lastly, uh, to uh, conclude, I so I, like if you're just starting out and watching this video, I was in your shoes in Digital Futures 2020 workshop where I learned style transfer. But then uh, the first thing I did was after the workshop, a lot of uh, uh, the tutors uh, shared their content on YouTube, Facebook. So I like just uh, watched all the workshops related to AI at Digital Futures. So it, it's also a good starting point if to check out 2020 and 2021 digital future workshops related to AI, which you which you will learn what are the applications relevant to architecture. And I made this GitHub. It's like uh, outdated, but uh, it's based on DF 2020, where what are the resources to get started? So I listed a few of the workshops from 2020, but also if you are from, there are amazing like courses by artists like from NYU, people like Gene Kogan uh, has did an incredible job. If And if you are also interested in the engineering part, there's one uh, data science for AEC and also uh, machine learning uh, for structural engineers at ETH, which has more AEC specific domain. But there are libraries and other things I have listed. So I'll share it in the chat. So any words of wisdom, I think that I've been sharing any links. So any other links, I'm actually, I'm posting them on YouTube and I'm getting great responses there. So anything else that you want to close with, or um, do we want to see you later? Like what's going on? Um, so, oh, oh, sorry, Meyer, I posted your Twitter account. Do you have an Instagram that you want to post or LinkedIn? And same with you, Daniel. Do you want us to post any more of your uh, LinkedIn or Instagram so people can find you. And if they're prof if there's a professional service, are you guys available for clients too? Um, Daniel and I were discussing about starting like some blockchain decentralized organization for architecture, where if people want some like uh, services or consultancy or in general, like uh, artwork or things developed by the community, for the community. Uh, we are open and looking for that idea. But um, I, I'm yet to see like a like a, like creative AI community just focused for architecture. So uh, maybe we could start one, Daniel. Uh, yeah, no, no and I think what's interesting is like, this is kind of like also in the early stages, but we're all kind of, at least uh, I, I think I'm like learning as much as I can now and just seeing like all the developments. There's like a lot of things that are coming out. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if you guys have any questions, like get in touch with me. I, I share my, uh, my Instagram and then I'm also sharing uh, my Twitter. You can find like kind of some of the interesting things that I repost there. Uh, but if you want to get in touch, if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, and, uh, and like, I, I also uh, run, or like I'm part of uh, like Ola Research, which I run with the uh, four other people. And we have been exploring like some of these uh, emerging technologies and seeing how we can apply them in like creative design. Um, so we're exploring how to use generative networks and how to connect them maybe to like uh, wider contests where we can sort of mine data from the internet and how to like visualize that type of data and how to create like impactful digital transformations that can be applied uh, to some design creativity or some sort of three-dimensional experience. Um, currently, we just developed a project recently where we deploy these technologies and we develop like this sort of virtual tower um, based on those methods. Uh, and um, yeah, if you guys are interested in learning about all that, um, there's like a page that we kind of dedicated to that project. I'm sharing the link. Uh, it's called like Poder de la del Data, which is in English is the, sorry, I think that's wrong. Poder de la Data, which is like the power of data. 
And the idea behind it was to take kind of like, uh, take like images from Instagram, like scrape them, and then I'll try to understand based on like very specific teams, uh, themes, like what is the relationship in like uh, some sort of uh, space, right? Like how are these images related? And then do an analysis on that and then take some of those things and transform it into a building using like uh, generative processes and other computational um, algorithms. Um, I, so I just wanted to say, Daniel and uh, Mayor, I've shared every link that you've put down on YouTube uh, to, for our viewership and um, anything else, because literally I think getting excited about coding is one thing, but not being disappointed that you don't have the results that you want quick. I think the mindset of an engineer sometimes is very different from a designer, but you guys are a new generation. So you expect it to be hard. <laughs> so what, what would you say, uh, what would you say to someone that really wants to be like you guys? What, 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 what does that mean? Do they have to go to engineering school? What, what do they have to do? Yeah. So like, I didn't do like any masters in computer science, but uh, honestly, if for learning, there are so many resources out there. And if you are like the self learning uh, uh, type of personality, you could figure it out. But also uh, like I used to attend a lot of conferences like almost every month. And Daniel and I used to like uh, find each other mostly in most of the conferences where like ECAD, Acadia, even those conferences had workshops on machine learning. And then we like, we matched our vibe and then we, we thought, okay, why not we, sh we do research and uh, uh, like uh, do coding ourselves. And the reason I'm saying is that once you start on this journey, if you find other people who are like-minded and like develop accountability, then that will also accelerate your learning. Yeah, and I, I was gonna say like, yeah, same, like I kind of met Mayor through like conferences and workshops just because we're, we're really interested in kind of this area. Um, and like what drives me is it's not necessarily kind of like the coding part about it, but, but it's more like the idea of like what is intelligence and like how this is encapsulated into like algorithms, right? And like how this has become something useful and how we're using all this data to be able to build representations of the world and how we take that sort of process and turn it into um, use, either useful products or like creative products and, and things um, that are helpful for everybody. So that's kind of what motivates me. And then the coding part about it, it's like, yes, yeah, like in the beginning, if you haven't learned how to code, it's gonna be hard um, if you're not used to that. Uh, but if you're really committed, like you'll get to it and start figuring it out. And once you get going, like once you first, like let's say you learn your first coding language, then all the other ones kind of become easier because uh, it's usually the same data structures, the same uh, way to process data. Um, so that becomes uh, easier through time. But I think uh, it depends on like what you're really interested in. If you're really interested and passionate about something, you'll just go and do it. And there's a ton of resources, like Mayor said, like now you can find resources everywhere and like I'll mention that again like if you're interested in like deep learning and stuff in like that world deep mind and open AI and uh like you can just go there and they post like a lot of stuff that you can just get started also like the PyTorch website it's great they have a lot of tutorials where you can code um your own neural networks from scratch and they'll provide like sort of like simple examples uh so yeah so that's that's my, that's what I can say about that. Yeah. And lastly, uh, to end, uh, I must say like it's coming and like it's people like us, uh, who, who once they start adopting this technology and find use cases in architecture will change the way we work in, in near future. And it's way more near than you might, you are assuming how much AI can change architecture, but we just need like a community and a mindset where we say we are gonna work this way and this is how things will be. Well, on that note, 
if if you don't have any other questions, um, maybe say your goodbyes. I think this has been one of the best. Um, very open. You guys were very open and generous with your time, and uh, our viewers really appreciate it. So you know, we're actually building our own GitHub, and we want to make a repository of knowledge. And you both are always invited in our family. We love you guys. Thank you for donating your time in our last festival. And we just want to continue the dialogue. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to you guys. I, I can only imagine how much effort you are putting it to uh, making this knowledge accessible to everyone. And the community Digital Futures is, I, I think it, it is life-changing for me. So I foresee like it's impacting a lot of people. So great, great work. Yeah, I want to say uh, thank you to like the whole Digital Futures team for putting all this together. Um, I think it's wonderful what you're doing. I actually got introduced to you guys last year. I attended a workshop done by uh, Daniel uh, Bolajang and uh, Charmin and uh, Manus uh, from Misto. Uh, and like it was it was kind of fascinating uh, that you guys were able to like, I guess, put that together online and then you have these great teachers that are teaching like some pretty interesting stuff and combining it with architecture. Uh, so that really kind of like opened my eyes. And uh, so I want to thank you guys for that. And yeah, uh, this is a great platform. Well, on, not, on that note, thanks again. Uh, everyone who has uh, joined today, please uh, continue asking us questions. Also, um, I think these, um, these collab scripts and the GitHub, will they be in, um, in the G drive? Will they be available or will they be like, what, what is the, what are we thinking about on that respect, the sharing of the G drive? Yeah, so once you like save a copy of collab, there would be like a folder in your G drive called collab notebooks and you'll find it there. Well, I just have to say one last time, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Daniel, for all of your time. It's de deeply appreciated. And all of our community really enjoyed this. And we look forward to talking with you soon. So goodbye, everyone. Thanks again. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching. <laughs>